This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, smile. And I'll tell you why I want you to do that in a moment. I want to consider with you today joy. We're learning about habits. And joy is foundational for habit formation. It is foundational for spiritual life. It is foundational for life, not just because it feels good, not in a self-centered way, in a way that I want to unpack for you and me in these moments really practically. I want to start with a very haunting story from Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace. He tells it at the beginning of this book. He repeats it in another book that Jesus I never knew. True story about a friend that uh, works with marginalized folks in Chicago who told Phil, a prostitute came to me in wretched straits, homeless, sick, unable to buy food for her two-year-old daughter. Through sobs and tears, she told me her story about how uh, her life and her little daughter's life was just a train wreck as she would do anything she could to get enough money su to support a drug, ha drug habit. At last, I asked her, I, I, I didn't know what to say to her, this person told Phil. Last, I asked her if she'd ever thought about going to a church for help. I will never forget the look of pure, naive shock that crossed her face. Church, she said. Why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible about myself. They would just make me feel worse. Then Yancey writes these words. What struck me about my friend's story is that women much like this prostitute fled toward Jesus, not away from him. The worse a person felt about herself, the more likely she saw Jesus as a refuge. Has the church lost that gift? There is an enormous problem for us if we associate thinking about God or spiritual life or scripture or goodness or faith with feeling bad, and yet many of us do. Many of us at some very deep level will associate the idea of the presence with God or God's will for our life is, I must feel bad about myself because I do so many bad things. And of course, I do do so many bad things, but spiritual life will never work that way. One of the most powerful places where we see that in the Bible is in the book of Nehemiah. You may remember this comes after the people of Israel had come back from exile. They have rediscovered God's will, the book of the law, the scripture, the story, the Torah. Here's how God wants you to live. And it's read for them, giving the meaning so that the people can understand what's being read. And then this is Nehemiah chapter eight, verse nine. Uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, the Levites were instructing the people said, this day is holy to the Lord your God, do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the Lord. They were aware of this enormous gap between who God wants me to be and who I actually am. And they felt terrible and they mourned and wept. And Nehemiah said, stop it. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food. Not just food, but choice food, French fries, hamburgers, pizza. Haagen-Dazs and sweet drinks, not just drinks, but sweet drinks, cola with lots and lots of sugar and wine coolers and send some to those who have nothing prepared. Give, be generous. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Then all the people went away to eat and drink and send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because now they understood the words that had been made known to them. The joy of the Lord is strength. Now this does not mean never mourn or never grieve. Often that will have to happen. In fact, in the very next chapter, Nehemiah chapter nine, we're told the people gather together again and they spend one quarter of the day confessing sin. One quarter of the day they stand and they hear as the law, God's book is read. And then a quarter of the day they stand confessing sin. There is a time to grieve. There is a time to mourn. However, if I primarily associate God or God's word, the scriptures, or spiritual life, or worship, or so, with feeling bad about myself, 
I, it will never be sustainable to be with God. I will not want to be with God and I must desire to be with God. So Psalm 16, for example, where there's that wonderful verse, I think it's the seventh verse, I have set the Lord always before me. He's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Then at the end, verse 11, it says to God, you will fill me with joy at your presence. I must associate God and his words primarily, fundamentally with, present, with joy because God loves me, because God loves you. He wants his face to shine upon you. He's glad he made you. He likes you. And in any relationship, uh, in my relationship with Nancy, if I don't associate that relationship with joy, it's not going to be sustainable. I've always felt like with Nancy, kind of our secret go-to strength, even in seasons when other things have been really hard is, we enjoy each other. She never ceases to remind me she was voted class comedian in high school because she's a fun person. She only had five people in her high school and three of them were German, so it was a low bar. Nonetheless, um, joy is at the foundation of a relationship and it is at habits. God made you to run on joy. And I want to explain how that's so. We're learning about habit formation and that it involves what is sometimes called a habit loop. This, these thoughts are from James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits. Always, when you're forming a habit, any behavior will involve these four dimensions, these four dynamics, a cue that is a prompt that triggers behavior. Now, we're surrounded by all kinds of sights and sounds all the time. What makes something a cue or a prompt? It tells you that a reward is obtainable. It tells you that you can get a reward, food or something to drink or something that will feel good or praise from other people. And then that sets up a craving. And uh, a craving is a desire. Either I want relief from pain or I want to obtain a good thing. What you want is not the habit itself. It's not to smoke the cigarette. It's the relief that the smoke brings. It's not to look at that clickbait. It's, oh, now my craving for curiosity can be satisfied or my board can be, uh, boredom can go away. It, it's not, nobody craves to take a shower, but that feeling of warm water on my skin and then that feeling of being clean. And our cravings will vary from person to person. If you have a real gambling problem and you hear those chimes and bells associated with a casino, it will create all kinds of thoughts and feelings in you that somebody who's not a gambler doesn't have. And then that craving in turn leads to a response, a particular kind of behavior that is about uh, getting the reward. And then that leads to the reward itself. Now the reward is, something that makes you feel good. That's what a reward is. The whole thing is built on reward. The cue is about the promise of a reward. The craving is the desire for a reward, the motivation. The behavior is to obtain a reward. And you do this from the time that you're an infant before you even have words in the joy of mastery of learning how to walk or how to talk or how to dress yourself or how to read something. God built you. The brain, Clear says, is a reward detector. God made you to run on the joy of rewards. And this is so central to spiritual life that Nehemiah actually has people associate the reading of scripture with choice food and sweet drink. And sometimes when we're cultivating habits, we'll use extrinsic rewards. If you're teaching a little kid how to read, you might give them a little food after they do that. Now, you don't want them always to read for an extrinsic reward for the sake of food. You want them to do it for the intrinsic proper reward, the joy of learning. But sometimes it might take another kind of reward to help us get there. And Nehemiah actually does this with people. He doesn't want them to associate God's presence and God's word with grief and mourning because then they will never develop the second nature desire to be with God. So this will help you as you look at habits of all kinds. But particularly today, I just want to ask, um, what are you doing to help associate God's presence with joy? And it can be very simple. Again, we're talking about very small steps. So for me, in the morning, 
Um, very often when I go to spend time together with God to read scripture or to pray, I will light a candle. And just that and the beauty of it reminds me God is light and he wants to come into my darkness. Um, very often for me, I will fix a cup of coffee because coffee to me is life and I love the aroma of it. And that reminds me, taste and see the Lord is good. Nancy and I very often when we have breakfast in the mornings, we have a little book uh, and we pray for numbers of folks, numbers of you. And we do that at breakfast time. That's a reminder, taste and see that the Lord is good. So today, take one moment when you will be with God. Maybe it's right now. As you think about the words of scripture, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Smile right now. And remember, God promises to fill you with joy at his presence. Grief, sorrow, confession, all these things are deeply necessary. And uh, discipline and effort, all of these things are a fundamental part of human life and human growth. But always, 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 gang, the foundation of them is joy. Our God is a God of joy. And when sorrow and guilt have been swallowed up in grace, joy will remain. The joy of the Lord, not just any joy, the joy of the Lord. Our well-being in his love and power, that is our strength. Love is habit forming. Hi, I'm Tim. Thanks for joining us here at Become New for Habits. Now, at the end of this series, we're going to sit down with John and bring him some of your questions and talk a little bit more about the topic. But we want to hear from you. We want to bring him your questions. We've heard from a couple of you, but I know there's more questions out there. So if you've got a question, you can put it in the comment box if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, or you can email it to us at becomenew.me at gmail.com, or you can text it to us at 855-888-0444. If you want to spread the word, you can subscribe on YouTube, share this video with a friend, or give us a review on a podcast wherever you're listening. See you next time.